yeah. all of you today. <clears throat> Grateful to be here with all of you today on the occasion of Radha Ashtami. And I'll speak broadly on three main themes of how, from a universal perspective, what is the significance of Shrimati Radharani from the specific perspective of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition of which we are a part, what is the significance of Shrimati Radharani? And then for our spiritual lives at whatever stage we are in, what is her significance? What is her relevance? What is the importance of her blessings? So let's begin with some verses from the Chaitanya Charitamrat, which illustrate the significance of Srimati Radharani's very special position. Now, so here, before I go into the verses, there is two important things to understand that it is very dis dif difficult to actually understand things if we don't see them in their context. Now, what does seeing things in their context mean? It can mean many things, but specifically, it means that we learn to see where they are being spoken and look at who was speaking to them, what was their intent in speaking to them, and what is the result of speaking to them. We live in a world today where we live in a world today where there is increasing polarization, increasing violence, increasing demonization of others. And often that results because of, because of a lowered consciousness. And Radharani is the manifestation of the most elevated consciousness that actually if you consider it is love that has the greatest potential to elevate our consciousness. When, when love is replaced by selfishness, by lust, then our consciousness shrinks to what's in it for me? What can the other person do for me? When people exploit or abuse or violate others, they're thinking of the other person, they've reduced the other person to an object. And what can this person you do for me? So when our consciousness shrinks, we don't even sense the consciousness of the other person. We see the other person as an object meant for our pleasure. But as our consciousness expands, then we start sensing realities beyond ourselves. And it is love that can cause the expansion of consciousness. But unfortunately, when our love is misdirected, or not directed toward the eternal object, the eternal object, then the expansion of our consciousness brings with it the potential to cause great hurt for ourselves. That means that if we expand our consciousness, as we care for someone, we care for something, then what happens is often that person can disappoint us, that person can betray us, that particular cause for which we work could end up, uh, disapp again, disappointing us or turning out to be not all that glorious. So what happens is there is love and there is the object of love. Love can expand our consciousness. Love can raise our consciousness. But at whom we are directing that love, that is extremely important. When we direct that love toward Krishna, who is the highest object of consciousness, who is the highest reality, then our consciousness expands in the fullest way, in a way that is joyful, that is not disappointing, that is not frustrating. So the world, if it needs anything today, it doesn't need more, it doesn't, we have climate change problems, we have inflation, we have shortage of resources, so many problems. But actually the biggest problem is that people's consciousness is shrunk, it is lowered. 
and we need to raise consciousness and radharani her her example and her blessings can both enable us to raise our consciousness so she embodies love but not not just she embodies love at the highest degree to the highest degree but she also embodies love directed toward the highest object so for example one way the consciousness has shrunk today is by reenvisioning human history and even current humans interactions in terms of power struggles that that oh the whole of human history is what men have been exploiting women and now it is the time for women to rise well well yes and no yes have people been exploited yes but throughout history it is just a human tendency for the powerful to exploit the power, powerless it is not just men who exploited women it is powerful men have exploited powerful men also so what happens is that we have particular perspectives through which we view things and then that perspective can extend to divinity also that why should god be male well the bhakti tradition explains that god is not just male in the abrahamic traditions god is portrayed as male but in the bhakti tradition it is understood that god is not just male but before we can understand is god male or female well the answer in the bhakti tradition is both he is both male and female but a more important answer is that before we can understand whether god is male or female or how god is both male and female we need to understand that we ourselves are neither males nor females we are spiritual beings so we are neither male nor female and god is both male and female so if we take simply our our particular preconceptions our particular lens and apply it to the divine then we may not understand things holistically still even with those lens the bhakti tradition is more inclusive because we don't have god just in a male form we have god as the divine couple as both male and female now radharani is understood in two ways one is that she is as i said god in the female form radha krishna ek atma dui deh dhari that she is one soul they manifest in two bodies annonya nilisla lila kari that they perform past time they rejoice in the past times so this god in the male form this god in the female form and in some ways god in the female form is considered higher because her love controls even krishna in fact that is one of the key differences between between the various consorts of krishna that radharani her love is so great that when she is upset krishna goes out of her way to please her so she, she now another understanding that she is the she is she is god in the female form but she is also god manifesting as his topmost devotee so there are both these roles and when we approach radharani we approach in both ways that she is god and she is also the greatest devotee of krishna so as as god in female form she can bless us uh, through her potency through her mercy and as a devotee as the topmost devotee in female form of course devotee is also blessed but as the topmost devotee in female topmost topmost devotee she exemplifies devotion she shows what the topmost devotion looks like so with this brief understanding so krishna is is god and prabhupada said we are establishing international society for krishna consciousness somebody may say that okay that if we say god is both male and female then why is it not international society for radha consciousness why is it in the <laughs> krishna consciousness well that's interesting one you know one of my friends is from a traditional south indian background south indians they worship god very much in uh, in the mood of awe and reverence so they said he said so let me you people have got it all wrong krishna is god and just refer to him as simply krishna there is no shri krishna no bhagwan krishna just krishna isn't that disrespectful and he said on the opposite 
you have Radha and you have a double honorific for Radha. You have first Srimati and then you have Rani. So it's a double honorific, not just Radha, Srimati Radha Rani. So there are double honorific for Radha and zero honorifics for Krishna. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> so I explained to him how actually Shla Prabhupada uh, coined an entire term, the English equivalent of Bhagawan, Prabhupada said it, the Supreme Personality of God. And that's the honorific that Prabhupada used consistently. So it is not that we don't, uh, we don't respect Krishna. It is that actually Prabhupada wanted us to have a personal relationship with Krishna. Prabhupada had a Prabhupada had a personal relationship with Krishna. Krishna is, a, is the most accessible personal divinity. And Krishna, we worship Krishna in Vrindavan. And in Vrindavan, nobody refers to Krishna as Bhagwan Krishna. Even as Sri Krishna, it's a Krishna. So Prabhupada brought some glimpses of that Vrajabhav into our relationship with Krishna. And yes, Prabhupada did systematically talk about Krishna's position in, in his books. So anybody who reads, reads the Shastras as explanation of Krishna Prabhupada's commentary, they will understand that Krishna is the ultimate reality. But at the same time, he's not just the ultimate reality, he's the ultimate intimate reality. He's the ultimate intimate reality. Tadure Tadvantike. He's far away, he's further than the farthest. And he is closer than the closest. So Prabhupada emphasized that. Now, on the other hand, okay, if that's the case, then why Radha is having a double honorific? Now, if you see, if you read the commentaries of uh, the books of Rupa Goswami or Jiva Goswami or Vishwanachaka Thakur, these are all prominent acharyas in our tradition, and they have written a lot on Vrajalila including the Radha Krishna pastimes. And there they refer to her simply as Radha. So, Bhakti Sudhan Swedakur would use Sri Radha. But it is Prabhupada who is the first person who coined this term Srimati Radha Rani. Now, Rani means queen. Srimati is honorific that refers to one who is imbued with Shri, Sriman and Srimati. Srimati means Shri can mean wealth, it can mean fortune, it can mean opulence. One who is infused, imbued, enriched with all these. So Srimati Radharani. Now, what was Prabhupada's point? That in India, there was a tendency that came up, especially after the, the empirical, the reductionistic lens were applied to the bhakti tradition and to broad tradition. There's an attempt to there's there's a tendency to see the Radha Krishna relationship as mundane, and especially because their relationship was in the what is called as the parkiras. I'll explain what it is soon. That their relationship was often seen as mundane, and not just as mundane, but as indecent. And there were people who frivolously claimed to justify uh, their own mundane and often uh, immoral activities by saying, actually, you know, they, they claim to be devotees and they claim to be saying that actually when we do these activities, it's not we who are doing these activities. It is Krishna who is entering into the male body. It is Radha who is entering into the female body. And when people do immoral activities, it is not we who are doing it, it is they who are doing through us. Now this is, this is perversion. Now there is, there is, there is an English word called rationalize. Now rationalize, it's a verb, which is spelled normally as R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L-I-Z-E. Or S-E, depending on which British or American English is used. But rationalize. However, it can be spelled in a different way and that is a revealing uh, spell. Rational lies. R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L L-I-E-S Rational lies. So when we rationalize, we tell lies and we use our rational faculty to justify those lies. So rationalize. 
So what happens is that in such situations, we end up uh, trivializing and distorting that which is sacred. We make it profane. And Prabhupada wanted to prevent that. And that is why Prabhupada was very emphatic that Radharani should be approached in a very reverential way. So that was still Prabhupada's mood that Krishna is approached in a very intimate way and Radharani is approached in a very respectful way, very reverential way. Actually, Prabhupada even, that is the kund of Radharani, the Radha kund. And Prabhupada, uh, the, in our tradition, Radha kund is considered the topmost of holy places. It is considered the embodiment of Radharani's love in liquid form. And Rupa Goswami and the great um, Gaudiya Vaishnava Acharyas, they talk about bathing in Radha Kund as the most purifying and most elevated of activities. But what happened is, uh, but what happened unfortunately is that when devotees went for the first time to bathe over there, they started, they were frivolous, they started swimming and tossing water on each other and just, they thought treated like a swimming pool. Oh, mother, this is not a swimming pool, this is a sacred place. And if you're so frivolous, better don't bathe in this. Oh, some devotees may take that as, a, take that as absolute instruction that we should never bathe in the Radha Kund. However, I already said that there is context. Prabhupada has translated the books of the previous Acharya, the message of the previous Acharyas, where he does say Radha Kund, bathing Radha Kund is a great fortune and we should tap that opportunity when we get it. But the point is, Prabhupada emphasized the reverential attitude very much. And that's why Srimati Radha, that's why the strong caution when bathing in Radha Kund. And that's why Shri Prabhupada, he didn't speak much about Srimati Radharani on Radha Ashtami. In the entire Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada refers to Radha only twice. If you do a search for Bhagavad Gita as it is, the word Radha comes only twice in the Bhagavad Gita. And where are those two things? In the introduction, when you, the Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwe. That prayer is there, the Sanskrit of the prayer and the translation of the Sanskrit. Those are the only two places where Radharani is mentioned. So Prabhupada maintained a very reverential attitude. And what is the, the, the idea is that I earlier said that, I said first, in terms of today's world, Radharani is the embodiment of the highest consciousness and the inspiration for raising our consciousness higher. Now, I'm looking at, in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, what is the position of Srimati Radharani? So, Prabhupada approached Radharani from a very reverential perspective. At the same time, she is at the heart of our tradition. So, I'll talk about two pastimes of Srimati Radharani that reveal her heart. Or rather, it is one pastime and two parts within that pastime. The <clears throat> the Ras Leela is considered to be the topmost pastime between Krishna and the gopis, on all of Krishna Leela. So Krishna plays his flute and calls the gopis to the forest for performing pastimes with them. And then the gopis come. And when the gopis come, at that time, uh, Krishna exchanges talks with the pleasantries and he says, okay, now you go back. You came here. Now you go back. Says, no, we want to be with you. Okay. And Krishna, when they insist like that firmly, Krishna says yes. And then they are performing the dance. And then it seems as if Krishna, they become proud and Krishna leaves them and goes away. And the, the gopis are shattered. And as they're shattered, they're looking around, where is Krishna gone? Now all the gopis, they are of a similar age, they have grown up together, they know each other very well. And they look and they see, hey, we're all here, but one person is not here. And that one person is mentioned in the Bhagavatam, that, that is elaborated in the, in the, elaborated in the, not in the Bhagavatam, but in the Goswami's literature, and that is Srimati Radharani. Initially, the reaction is, hey, the special person that Krishna has gone with. Oh, it's Radha. They all know that their love, that their love for Krishna is nowhere and compared to the love of Radharani for Krishna. So what happens is, 
as radharani is going with krishna krishna is leading her deeper and deeper into the forest initially she is elated that krishna is going with me alone she feels overwhelmed that oh krishna has selected me for this special attention but then her heart turns towards others and she starts thinking that what will be the plight of my sakhis of lalita of vishakha of tunga vidya of champakalata of sudevi of rangadevi they will be shattered by the by being away from krishna by the thought that krishna has abandoned and rejected them and gone away and how can i be happy when my dearest friends are so unhappy so this is what is the summit of selflessness radharani could have said i didn't want to, i didn't want that i told krishna come with me krishna chose to go with me if krishna turned away from them krishna is god it is krishna's choice and they must have done something because of which krishna turned away from them why should i care that's between them and krishna hmm? but other end does not do that okay this is the level of our expanded consciousness so in the yoga tradition the idea is our consciousness expands 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 till it reaches the ultimate reality and then we become immersed in the ultimate reality that is that is the yoga tradition but the bhakti yoga tradition takes it further is our consciousness expands from self centeredness toward bigger and bigger reality till it reaches krishna but then when our consciousness reaches krishna it doesn't stop it's like our consciousness reaches krishna and then with krishna in our consciousness our conscious comes back to the world and then embraces the whole world that is considered to be the most evolved form of consciousness chila prabhupad was in vrindavan prabhupad's heart was always in vrindavan and he was physically in vrindavan and at that time people of his age who were way past 50 or 60 they would go to vrindavan primarily to retire and prabhupad was repeatedly leaving vrindavan going to vrindavan leaving vrindavan going to vrindavan leaving vrindavan and finally prabhupad left vrindavan to come to america however that is really an external vision prabhupad didn't leave vrindavan to go to america prabhupad took vrindavan in his heart to and went to america now we can take a pure devotee out of the dham but we cannot take the dham out of the pure devotee hmm we can take a pure devotee out of the dham but we can't take the dham dham and a lot of dham out of their heart out of the pure devotee so wherever prabhupad went he manifested vrindavan so that is prabhupad was in vrindavan and he was relishing the relishing the remembrance of krishna the absorption in krishna that's what his heart long for when prabhupad was in college his biggest dream you know when most of us are in college our dream is we want to see some 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 maybe some disney land uh, some something like that we want to go some amusement park some adventure sports the prabhupad's dream was you know when can i get enough money to buy the train ticket to go to jagannath puri and see lord jagannath that is prabhu patro but long to be in the dham but his consciousness didn't just expand to reach the lord from the lord it reached the world again and prabhu pad was concerned about all the souls in the world who are bereft of krishna consciousness whose shrunk consciousness is causing suffering to them and is causing suffering to others prabhu pad wanted to reach out to them so prabhu pad may not have talked much about radharani but she embodied the mood of shrimati radharani he embodied her mood through his service attitude not just caring for krishna but caring for everyone in relationship with krishna and then what happened shrimati radharani as she was thinking about her sakhis oh they must be shattered in the absence of krishna so what to do so krishna was taking her along so she came up with various excuses krishna that flower is so beautiful can you get that flower for me now the vrindavan forest was filled with many beautiful flowers but radharani deliberately pointed to a flower which was high up and what would happen is krishna would have to jump up jump 
people to try to reach that flower. And in getting that flower, what has happened is their, their movement into the forest would be delayed. And if the movement in the forest would be delayed, the chance of the other Sakhis finding them would increase. And, and Krishna would reach out and give the flower, he give the flower to Radha and Radha said, can you put it in my hair? And you put it, and put the put the hair in her flower in her head, and they kept moving forward. And then Radharani, again, hey, Krishna, do you see how beautiful the sight is? Look at the moon, how beautiful it is. Can you just stop and look at the moon? In this way, she was making various excuses. And one time she said, Krishna, that flower, you know, it's so nice. Can you get it? Now there was no way even Krishna could jump and reach that flower. So Krishna is God. But Krishna does not manifest his godhood usually during intimate pastimes. Sometimes he manifests, but most of the time, just just acts like a normal human being. So then finally Krishna told Radharani that, okay, I can't reach it. I'll do one thing. I'll lift you up. I'll lift you up and you can reach up and you can take the flow. And he lifted Radharani up and Radharani was trying to reach, reach. She was deliberately taking a long time to reach. I can't reach. Can you lift me up a little bit more? Can you lift me up a little more? Now, at one level, this is a very intimate pastime, but at another level, it is also reflecting Radharani's love, not, not just love between Radha and Krishna, but it is all Radharani's concern for her sakis. And now what happens is, the Bhagavatam tells this story, not directly, but through the lens of the sakis. When the sakis, they see that in all the other gopis, See, oh, Krishna has disappeared. Where has he gone? Then they become like transcendental detectives going on a treasure hunt. And then for them, the treasure is Krishna. And all along when they're going, look, they're looking at the footsteps. Oh, there is Krishna's footsteps here. Other is footsteps here. There's a, there's, a male, there's a male footstep, there's a female footstep. And as they keep moving forward, hey, what happened over here? There's one footstep is very deep. Oh, that means Krishna must have been uh, rising up. That's why his is Heels are not there, but his front of the legs are very deep. And here is, a, here is only one footstep. And say, oh, here, Krishna must have picked up this gopi. And what were they doing? Oh, they were speaking of a flower. So what happens is, the Bhagavatam tells this narrative from this perspective. And then as they go on and on, throughout, Radharani is coming up with various excuses. And still Krishna just keeps moving forward. And then finally Radharani says, what to do now? Things, and she says, Krishna, I'm feeling very tired. Can we just sit for some time? No, she said, Krishna, I'm feeling very tired. I cannot walk anymore. She doesn't say, can we sit? I cannot walk anymore. And Krishna apparently becomes angry. And he speaks in a very stern voice. Hmm? Because this is a forest, I cannot get a palanquin for you, although you are a queen. Therefore, you can climb on my back and I'll carry you. And he's speaking this, but he's speaking in such an angry tone. Radharani is looking here, there. She see, she's looking to see, are any of the Sakhis coming? How far can I, how much, how long do I have to keep Krishna waiting? So when she hears Krishna's voice, she turns around. She's shocked to see hear the sternness, the anger in Krishna's voice. And she looks around and she says, Krishna has disappeared. And then she understands what has happened. Yes, Krishna thought that I was taking his association for granted. And that's why Krishna got angry with me. And Krishna went away. And she sat with her. And now, it, actually what happens is, she just, it's, it's, she goes mad. There is mad, there is, there is ordinary madness and there is divine madness. Divine madness is called as Divya Unmad. Now, if you consider that this is our ordinary reality that we experience. And when somebody goes mad, they become disconnected with the ordinary reality and just go into their mental world, into their imagination. Hmm? So somebody who is mad, may, somebody who has gone mad, they may hear voices, although there's nobody around them. Hmm? They may start talking with somebody when there's nobody there next to them to talk, for them to talk with. So basically, normally we talk about somebody has become unhinged. That their, their perceptions and actions have no connection with reality. That's when we say that that person has gone mad. So there is ordinary madness, but then there is divine madness. So 
when a person becomes disconnected from ordinary reality, that is ordinary madness from daily reality. But when somebody becomes disconnected from ordinary reality, but they become connected with the higher reality, that is divine madness. And Radharani starts exhibiting this divine madness. So, illustrate this divine madness. If we consider that this is physical reality. So in our day to reality, there are, there are cars and buildings and people and our workplace and so on. This is physical world. Now that is where we perceive and we act. Our perceptions, our perceptions go in the direction. We perceive outward, we perceive inward and we act outwards. That's what normally happens. But now, when what happens is when somebody is becoming a little imbalanced, unhinged, their connection with the physical world becomes thinner. That's why you see these thinner arrows. And their connection with their own imaginary world, that they're imagining, that becomes too strong. So here somebody might imagine that there are flying horses, and there are all kinds of imaginary objects. So when a person's connection with the physical world diminishes and their own, they look at lost in their head. That's the beginning of madness. But this is ordinary madness. In contrast with that, there is spiritual madness or divine madness. And divine madness is what? Mahaprabhu exhibited that madness. So Radharani exhibits that madness. So what is that? A person may still have some connection with the physical world. They may still have capacity for imagination. But their connection with the spiritual reality, where they are communicating with Krishna, they become absorbed in Krishna. And they become dis dis disconnected from the world. That is divine madness. And Radharani starts exhibiting this divine madness. How? What happens is, although Krishna has disappeared, and if we had stumbled into the forest of Vrindavan at that time, we would see Radharani all alone. This, this divinely beautiful goddess standing alone. And it's almost like she's talking and talking to the wind or talking to the trees or talking to the sky, talking to the night sky. There's nobody there. Whom are you talking with? But what happens is Radharani sees Krishna there and she's, although Krishna has gone, she sees Krishna and she's desperately beseeching Krishna, please come back. Please come back. He says, Krishna, Krishna, please don't leave me and go away. So, um, Kavi Karanapur in Anand Vindavan Champu brings, describes his whole conversation. So Radharani says, Krishna, please don't leave me and go away. And Krishna says, don't leave me. I don't like anyone who becomes proud. Even if you are a great devotee, I don't tolerate pride. Radharani says, Krishna, but I had not become proud. I was only concerned about my sakhis. Now you had left them and they would be heartbroken. No, I chose you. I wanted to be with you. Why are you concerned about them? Why are you not concerned about me? I'm concerned about you, Krishna. But they love you. I was concerned about them because you care for them and they care for you also. So Krishna says, no, I don't like it when my devotees disrupt my plans. This is Krishna. Please, please come back. I'll be with you. I'll do whatever you tell me. Radharani says, Krishna says, it's too late now. I'm going. Krishna, please don't leave me. I'm all alone in this forest. I'm in this forest, in this dark. How will I be with you, without you? Krishna says, the Sakhis you care for so much, they are also in the dark. They are also in the forest. Just as they are well, you'll also be well. Krishna says, as Krishna says, Radharani says, but no, Krishna, they at least have each other. I am completely alone. It is you who brought me here alone and how can you abandon me now? And Krishna is very stern. He says, everyone has to pay for the, conse pay the consequences of their actions. And then, when Radharani hears the final finality, in Krishna's words, she senses Krishna has gone. And when Krishna goes, 
it's almost like life goes out of her body and she fades she fades she swoons over there so what's happening here is that actually speaking at such a time she uh, the, the body the human body has the capacity capacity to experience a certain amount of pain if the pain becomes too much if somebody is in a terrible accident then what happens is if the pain is too much you become unconscious there's bodily injury but our the bodily injury is already there but our capacity to tolerate pain is limited and when the pain seems to be going beyond our threshold capacity to tolerate then the defense mechanism is to just turn off our consciousness and this can happen because of physical pain this can also happen because of emotional pain so kavikarna so kavikarna food describes that actually radharani would have died over there but it is it is he says murcha devi murcha devi is actually rindavan everything is personal so murcha devi is the goddess of fainting so the goddess of fainting comes over there and she embraces radharani and because of her embrace radharani she doesn't pass away she she fades hmm? she doesn't pass away she passes out hmm? she fades and then she is just lying on the ground shattered and all the gopis are searching and they are searching 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 and after some time they stumble on her and when they see she is lying over the rock so, so shattered and alone initially they are feeling why did krishna leave all of us to go go to with her alone they know this gopi must be someone special that krishna loves her so much that's why they've gone krishna must have gone with her but still they feel a little they feel a little bad why did krishna leave us but then when they see oh, this gopi krishna has left her also and gone away then immediately the empathy in their heart comes up that how much great must have been her pain her agony krishna has gone away from us but none of us have fainted krishna has left her and she has fainted so great is must be her agony and so great is her agony that means so great must be her love and immediately lata vijaya they think they look for a kund nearby they get some water and they sprinkle water on radharani's face and they bring her back to consciousness and they when they bring her back to consciousness at that time they all they all uh, they they talk radharani is she so broken hearted she can't even speak but somehow in broken words she tells what has happened and all the gopis become resolute we have to find krishna and they all start searching for krishna they search 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 they go deep into the forest in searching for krishna but they cannot find krishna and um, this is symbolic we humans even if we have a longing for transcendent longing to know the ultimate reality longing to know the divine you know we cannot know the divine by our own effort we can perceive the existence of the divine that god exists we can make a rational argument for god but the nature of god that god is a bluish black cowherd boy who plays a flute and wears a peacock feather that we cannot arrive at by any reasoning for that rational theology is not enough you know, we need revelational theology it is only by god's revelation that we can find him in his fullness so the gopis are searching frantically for krishna but they can't find it and then they all decide we can't find krishna by searching so they come back they come back to the place where they have had the deepest experiences with krishna rahasi samvedo yaru de sprusha rahasitam priya prem vikshanam viharanam chate dhyan mangalam rahasi samvedo yaru de sprusha kuha kono manaha shobhayanti he so they come to the banks of the jamuna where krishna has smiled sweetly at them krishna has cast side long glances at them krishna has revealed his heart and confidence to them 
they have had the most intimate exchanges of love with krishna and there with their hearts and minds infused with the deep remembrance of krishna they sit down in a circle and all the gopis are sitting in a circle and they are envisioning that krishna is in the middle of that circle and they all start offering prayers to krishna and that prayer is the gopi geeta the 31st chapter of the 10th canto of the shrimad bhagavatam so it is described as gopya uchuhu so gopya and uchu both are plural words so now what does this mean is it that all this gopi geet is some song which all the gopis have memorized before and all of them are reciting it in chorus no not at all it is they are composing it at that moment they are their devotion is expressing itself in exquisite poetry and each verse jeev goswami explains in the in the gopal champu that each verse in the gopi geet is composed by one one gopi and he explains which gopi it is however when each gopi is speaking she is both speaking her heart as an individual and she is expressing the heart of the entire group as a representative of that group so there is this there is individuality and unity in bhakti so there is unity and unity in diversity but that is the that is the, you could say individuality and unity both are demonstrated over here unity in diversity and diversity in unity all the gopis are praying to krishna and all their prayers are basically krishna please come back please come back please come back they are using different arguments to reason with krishna please come back please come back so there the prayer is one in that sense there is unity in diversity but at the same time there is also diversity in unity that one prayer but each prayer is coming from but there is one request but each request is coming from different hearts each of those requests are coming from each individual heart made with a call impassioned call from a different perspective and finally as the gopis complete their prayer they are sitting in a circle they are they are envisioning as if krishna is there and then at the end of their prayers krishna actually appears krishna appears and reveals himself so this is actually an amazing pastime at many levels so radharani's love is revealed over here but radharani does not delight she is undoubtedly the greatest devotee but she does not delight in one up smanship see i am the greatest devotee and everybody should know i am the greatest devotee no she, the greatness of her devotion is that even when krishna selects her she is concerned about other devotees and eventually krishna comes back and krishna says to all the gopis that you have conquered my heart that you have rendered such service that i can never repay you so bhakti is both an individual activity and a collective activity and radharani by her example demonstrates that krishna is pleased when we remember him exclusively we focus our heart on remembering him but krishna is also pleased when we are concerned about the other devotees we seek their welfare we try to serve them and in this combination of expanding our consciousness toward krishna and expanding our consciousness toward other devotees in both of these through both of these we can actually become more and more krishna conscious so we could say extending our consciousness toward krishna directly is reclusive bhakti reclusive bhakti means we turn away from the world to turn toward krishna to focus directly on krishna but bhakti is not just reclusive it is also inclusive where we include the world we include other devotees include not just other present devotees but other potential devotees also and we try to we try to connect them with krishna we try to provide them an opportunity to raise their consciousness that was shri prabhupada's mood shri prabhupada could immerse himself in his bhajan when prabhupada would sing vishnu bhajan he would just get transported to another world prabhupada would do kirtans sometimes close his eyes and just absorb himself prabhupada could do that but prabhupada would then open his eyes wide 
and then you would pay attention to who was there and you would share Krishna's love with them, offer prayers for them on their behalf for Krishna. One time in Australia, one woman asked Prabhupada, Swamiji, can you pray for me? And Prabhupada replied, I'm always praying for you. Otherwise, what reason would I have to travel so far all over the world? So Prabhupada was actually, Prabhupada's Krishna consciousness was both reclusive and inclusive. And that Bhupad was manifesting Radharani's mood. And we can pray to both Srimati Radharani and to Srila Prabhupad to give us mercy by which we all can raise and expand our consciousness so that our consciousness reaches Krishna and our consciousness reaches others in a mood of service to Krishna, drawing them closer to Krishna and thereby drawing ourselves closer to Krishna. So I'll summarize. I spoke three main points today. First, I talked about how bhakti tradition has a very inclusive theology. That God is not just male, but both male and female. But it is a spiritual theology. So we need to understand that we are neither male or female because we are spiritual beings. And then, within that, I talked about how within the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, Radharani is central. Prabhupada was very reverential because Radharani is dealing with Krishna could be easily misunderstood as mundane or as even immoral. So Prabhupada was, that's why he used Srimati Radharani and he didn't talk much about Radharani. But he introduced us to the whole tradition where there's so much discussion about Radharani. And in that connection, I talked about two pastimes of Radharani or two incidents in the same pastime. First is, even when she is with the devotees, even when, when, even when she is with Krishna, she's concerned about other, others, about her sakhis. So a devotee doesn't want to enjoy Krishna for himself or herself. A devotee wants to share Krishna with everyone else. And then, and Krishna left her also, she went into a state of divine madness and discussed how that is different from ordinary madness. Ordinary madness is where we just become disconnected from physical reality and go into imagination. Whereas in divine madness, we become disconnected from physical reality, but we get connected with higher reality, the ultimate reality. And then finally, Yes, the Gopi Gita, in which Radharani is central, but she does not take a central position. She actually embodies with all the Gopis unity in diversity and diversity in unity. And Srila Prabhupada had that similar mood of Radharani, not just absorption in the Lord, but absorption in compassion for all living beings. And with that, he attracted millions of people toward Krishna. And we can also pray for Radharani's mercy and Prabhupada's mercy. Thank you very much. Radha Shtami Maha Mahutsav Ki Jai. Shtami Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Jai. Thank you so much, Charam Prabhu, for this wonderful class. We want to express on behalf of Hare Krishna Africa platform a deep appreciation for honoring our invitation to come and give us this wonderful um, sharing on this day. Um, we know your busy schedule and then we know that you have next engagement in the short time but I don't know if it is not going to be too inconvenient uh, can you give like 10 minutes uh, so that maybe the will will ask one or two questions just maybe one question through. I had to leave for a program immediately I'm sorry about that one question, mm -hmm. here. question. okay um, who is going to be the not person to have the questions well, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity and uh, Sri Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. I think we may have to uh, let you go and then uh, we'll ask you questions next time because you are very busy. Uh, the question may take different turns. But we really appreciate your uh, presence here and the love and guidance given to us. Thank you so much. Hare Thank Krishna. you very much for this opportunity to speak and Hare Krishna. wish you all a very happy Radha Ashtami. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Ki Jai. Hare Ki Jai. Shmati Radharani Ki Jai. Radha Ashtami. Wow. So Ki Jai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.